Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar. This is a presentation by Landfall Solutions, Keyed In, and Next Level Now. And this is uh, on analytics that predicts success for professional service teams. Um, I'm, this is Mark Solberg. I'll be the moderator, and I'll also be a panelist in the uh, presentation today. Uh, we also have with us Tim Short, who's the Senior Vice President of Customer Experience and Operations at Keyed In. Uh, Keyed In's a professional service automation firm. We have Brandy Bonds, who's a CFO at Next Level Now, Inc. out of Boston. Uh, and Brandy uh, works with professional service companies and uh, also gets involved in various uh, software implementations. I'm just going to cover a few uh, housekeeping chores as we get started up here. Um, so this is going to be a one-hour presentation. It should be about 45 to 50 minutes worth of uh, presentation material, and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, the phone lines will remain on mute throughout the session for attendees. Um, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A box that you are option that you can select in the go to webinar. So feel free to do that. Uh, we are recording the webinar, and we'll make this available later. So if you wanted to come back and revisit some of the topics, and then we'll also uh, share the slides from the session. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick check to make sure everyone's here. So Brandy, you're on the line right I sure am okay and Tim are you on audio now I am cool all right well welcome and the goal of our session today is to think around the notions of creating a profitable and predictable services business we're going to start with what makes a successful project so um, big word here that we've come up with is predictability to deliver on time on budget meet stakeholder expectations. Predictability is an uh, incredible uh, attribute necessary for successful projects. So I'm going to start out with um, a couple questions for everybody. But uh, my take on this is that predictability comes with discipline. And discipline is not just necessarily um, you know, software. Uh, it's uh, having to do with rules and procedures that people are going to follow. Uh, and then complying with those rules and procedures. But I'll start with uh, Brandy and Tim. How have you applied predictability to your practice or your clients? So Brandy, I'll let you go first on how you've applied yeah. pr predictability. So when we go into any engagement, the first thing we do is we ask for the goals of the organization and the management team, observe what we see operationally versus their strategic goals and initiatives, and then study the past results towards those targets to see what correlations we can come up with and apply a plan for that business to make sure that it's something that they can see what's going to happen in the future for their organization so they can plan better. Okay, and Tim, how about from your perspective, what you've applied on predictability in your practice? We've done similar things. One of the things that's most important to us is to ensure that we take the experiences that we have had, the expertise that we've had in those experiences, and apply them to what we call a customer's journey. We try and ensure that not only do we meet stake stakeholder expectations, but we identify early and regularly check on what those um, expectation achievements are. We want to ensure that we're not only supporting the goals of the organization, but outlining what that journey and experience will be. And we found that it, when we identify the journey and we work in, in perpetual partnership with our clients, that we can be more predictable on our outcomes. And we do that through a myriad of, of ways that we'll talk about through the presentation today. All right, thank you. So now, as it relates to predictability, we have another topic that's critical is what can get in the way of predictability. <clears throat> so separating what's urgent from what's important. And it's uh, easy to get dragged into things that may come up, but avoiding fire drills is quite often a problem. Uh, gathering data in a timely manner. Uh, don't make decisions based on old data. And then getting the team to leverage tools, which they have invested. Um, getting buy-in on a platform. And one of the things, my perspective on this, is that buy-in on the platform is that you can put new software in place, new procedures in place, and if you lack compliance with it, 
and people are not going to actually adhere, then all of that's been a waste. So I think it's always critical at the front end of this to, you know, get buy-in up front to uh, make sure that everybody's on board with it. And also that should be a top-down thing that from the executives down will embrace uh, the, the practices. So, Tim, from your perspective, what have you, types of things have you seen get in the way of predictability? Well, one of the experiences that I've I've um, I've had personally is is working with executives that forget about the strategic plan, and they get really excited about something that they've just heard or seen, and they they cause a fuss and a flurry about that new thing and excitement. And people tend to follow those executives and they get excited about that. And it's a distraction from the things that we have previously planned. And so one of the things that, that I've, I've seen necessary for a PMO is to have the ability to go back to the agreed upon plan and having that plan in a place that's common for everybody within the organization to remind people that we we need to proceed as planned or we need to replan and not to just chase what I've called the, the, the golden snitch for those of you who are fans of, of Harry Potter. Don't chase the snitch when you've already got a plan. Put it into something that you can prepare a plan for and ensure that you're delivering against the plan because if you've done it right, You've proven that that plan equals the capacity of the organization based on utilization of your resources and based on resources, financial and otherwise. And um, that's, that's one of the things that gets in the way more than we'd like to admit that um, executives being really excitable about a new thing and causing people a similar excitement for getting to execute on the thing we've already agreed upon. All right. Thank you for that. And Brandy, how about from your perspective? Yeah, I agree with Tim, but one of the things that we also see is focus, focus and, and actually creating that plan and following it to Tim's point. But when you don't have focus and to Tim's point, you follow that, we call it the unicorn, um, it, it impedes you from being able to predict well. So the more you study your data and having good data actually can get in the way of predictability as well, because it, a lot of people have an idea of what they think is going on in their business or what they think they're going to see in the future. But in reality, it's often a very different picture. And if you don't have good access to data in order to make these informed decisions and make this plan, it's going to be very hard to be able to predict accurately. All right, so to keep going on uh, the predictability uh, concept, we're going to move into really the main point of the whole session, five metrics that predict success. Um, forecasted revenue, uh, then from there working with budget versus actuals, uh, capacity planning, utilization, and finally, project management. We're gonna break each of these down. So we'll go straight into forecasted revenue. So um, question for Brandy, um, what are your thoughts on determining revenue quality? I'll bring a few points up here, but um, from the standpoint of assessing revenue quality, maybe share your thoughts, Brandy, around how you work with your clients. Yeah, you wanna really have a solid understanding of seasonality, trends in your revenue pattern, Focus on levels of service offerings that you have. Is it going to be revenue that is recurring on a fixed fee? Are you going to get it all at once and have to make that revenue last throughout the whole year? And then also being able to change the way you sell in order to meet your customers' needs. So really determining where your revenue is coming from. Is it a one-time, one option? So every time you bring revenue in, is it one customer, one invoice, one lump sum of revenue? Or do you have some ability to spread that out throughout the year and make it more predictable? And Brandy, we're finding more and more in our practice 
that revenue types are becoming more prevalent. We used to, in yeah. the services world, have an hourly revenue type. But we're yeah. seeing the trend in services, especially in technology, go to various revenue types. We've introduced yeah. in our practice things like um, fixed fee recurring revenue to where mm -hmm. our customers buy at a discounted rate a monthly recurring uh, service and we can plan for that service at the beginning of the month. We can allocate our resources to it, whether or not they use it, and then ensure that we've got coverage every month. We're also doing fixed fee implementation offerings, things that are, yep. hey, it's this much, and we're going to deliver outcomes instead of deliver hours, which is yep. changing the way that we have to forecast our revenue, which I think is tremendously important. We can't just say, well, it's this person for this amount of time, because the, the way that we're booking new revenue offerings is changing. And so it's, it's pretty exciting for us to see these revenue, forecasted revenue come in in types inside of that quality as well. Yeah, completely agree. Okay, next we'll move into a little more detail on forecasting. So when thinking of budgeting and forecasting, to me the word diligence and discipline, words dis diligence and discipline come to mind because you certainly have to be diligent about it and then you have to have the discipline to stay with it and continue to uh, learn from your successes with forecasting and, and continue to revise. Uh, question for Tim, when it comes to forecasting, what are your thoughts on planning and execution? Well, I think that the, the, there's there's a right way and a wrong way to forecast. In a lot of services organizations um, that are that are selling time, we've we've forecasted simply the time of our individuals, and we've said, well, I have these people that work for me, and they work for me 40 hours a week. So isn't it reasonable to suggest that that I should have them available to forecast for 40 hours a week? And we've learned that that is a way of life that's going away. Thank heaven. For those of us who were, had been involved in uh, PwC or Booz Allen or some of the major consultancy firms, that was the expectation was, I don't care about your travel. I don't care about your family. I don't care if you eat lunch. Your billable time is 100% because we forecasted that. And I think it's becoming more and more important to look at a person's true utilization ability and to forecast against that person's true ability. My team uh, assesses a right around 70 to 73 percent for our consultants because we recognize it's not realistic for them to have any sort of life, any happiness at scale with our organization and to deliver much more than that. So it's important that when we're looking at forecasting time, number one, that we're looking at forecasting reality. But forecasting isn't just about our, our human resources. In order to forecast appropriately, we found it tremendously important to also forecast outside factors like money and to forecast the availability of contractors, to forecast the availability of, of things that we don't directly control. And so when you look at the totality of an opportunity, it's not just singular in, I've got these people to do this work. We're looking at it in a true and total capacity to be able to deliver a body of work. And that's where capacity planning and forecasting start to interrelate through those four objects. All right, and then I have a question for Brandy. What's been your experience in taking a company that's been undisciplined with budgeting uh, and you've been able to turn, have, help them turn the corner and become committed to a continuous project or process of forecasting? Yeah, so I have a really great example for that, so I'm glad that you asked. Um, we had one IT client that when they came to us about a year and a half ago, they had no money in the bank, their line of credit was exhausted, they had, the owners had not been able to pay themselves as they had promised their significant loved ones that they would. So they were really in rough shape. By taking time to put together a forecast and a full plan for them, 
measuring it, looking at their customer mix. In six months time, we were able to pay off their line of credit, pay back all of the past payroll. And now here we are a year and a half later, we're working on them acquiring other businesses because it's truly become a way of life for them in measuring, monitoring, and adjusting when needed their business model. That's great, thanks. So some major pillars of project management forecasting, which is often manifested as a notion of a crystal ball or people making it you know, very artsy. Um, there are several factors that come into play regarding forecasting. So Brandy, uh, start with you and have you tell us your thoughts on um, understanding bandwidth. Yeah, so project scheduling is heavily dependent on upon a resource's ability to complete work. And what that means is different roles require different levels of information and the ability to execute differently. So being able to understand exactly what is needed in your organization to facilitate a project, if you have a service contract that requires different levels of resources, making sure that you have those resources to get that project done and understanding how much you can take on with the resources that you have. Okay, and Tim, what are your thoughts on the uh, impacts of communications on forecasting? It's huge. If, if we're not communicating as an organization, and, and if we don't have a central repository for communications, things get lost and people start to divert their time from the things in which they should be working. Um, I'm a big fan of constant and consistent communications that are relevant to the project and the efforts that are ongoing to deliver that project. And I know we're talking a little bit about services industry. We're talking about delivery of certain um, services by individuals. And I continue to mention projects. Um, Brandy and I both continue to mention projects. I really feel as though, and, and have learned through experience that even in a, in a services delivery environment, that we're really delivering a project. We have an expectation from a client and we need to be able to communicate those expectations through milestones, key deliverables, forecast expectations, and lastly, communication. So. Um, I think if you fail communicate, to co communicate appropriately, you're likely to fail. Mm -hmm. I'm going to address the next topic of learning from experience. Um, I had an interesting uh, experience myself at a, uh, a conference where they brought a uh, former fighter pilot up to speak about how they are applying um, their experience in uh, military to business. And one of the things that happens after every uh, flight mission is that there's a debriefing where they go through every last bit of what occurred up there and the snap decisions that people made, you know, because lives depend on it. So one of their standards is they always do a post-mortem on every mission that they go on. And I've seen with our clients over the years where, you know, they'll, if, if they're good about it, they will get together after a project, review what happened on the project and uh, learn from that to try and improve on it. Because Forecasting can be such an arty thing, especially you get into a lot of design firms that we'll work with and architectural um, software companies where uh, people are doing their best to estimate based on what they believe is going to happen and learning from experience is really a, a critical point. So I think that's a, definitely something for everybody to focus on. Uh, Brandy, from your perspective on prioritizing focus, uh, how, do your, how do you coach your clients on defining and prioritizing focus? Yeah, we need to ensure that people are working on the right thing at the right time. And you're going to see more about this when we talk about utilizations. But one of the definitions of stakeholder is one who is involved in or affected by a course of action. And this action could result in the project or it could be someone who is impacted by the work. It's really important to set the goal of the project and make sure that whenever you're moving forward in that project that you're focused on that goal, whether it be it's to the account owners, to the customers, to the project managers, we just have to make sure that we're all 
moving towards that goal, it's very easy to get derailed <laughs> and see yeah. the next shiny thing and be able to try and tackle that. The golden snitch. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and our final topic here, Tim, I'll uh, hit you with this one. What are your thoughts on risk management and removing obstacles? Yeah, very simply, if you don't plan for your risks, if you don't identify risks, these aren't things that are always going to come true. But if you don't plan them in with mitigation plans and have an issues registry to be able to, to exercise some sort of action against a realized risk as an issue, you're you're not setting yourself up for true forecasting and planning. It's very simple. There, I don't think any of us have ever had a project that's gone exactly as planned and has never realized there's a risk for having issues. And so I think re removing obstacles is planning for us. All right, from here we're gonna move into budget versus actuals. And Brandy, how about you share your thoughts on uh, how you work with your clients when planning budgeting and reporting activities to get them to focus on the follow-up of budget versus actuals? Yeah, it can be challenging at time because a budget versus actual and that reconciliation that happens really holds businesses, managers, and owners accountable to what the numbers are telling you. Are we doing what we decided that we would do? One of the other key points that has to happen when reconciling a budget versus actual is adjusting the budget. Sometimes the business isn't going as we had planned, so we want to adjust that forecast and keep it fluid because the business will evolve over time and you want to be able to account and predict that moving forward to the best that you can. You also want to craft your metrics to meet your organization to give you snapshots that will allow you to see what the goals you set were, how are you coming to them, and what, what does that look like so that you know what you need to adjust. And then Tim, from your perspective, maybe share some thoughts on uh, some of your clients' considerations in this area. Yeah, so our clients, um, we've always told them that forecasting is an art that takes continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And you can establish a baseline forecast or a budget. It, forecasting and budgets are a very similar, um, just in different semantics. And it's very important that you're continuously updating and improving. You have to baseline your initial forecast or budget. But if you don't capture the actuals, and this is where it gets really interesting when you're in change management with an organization. We found people often, in their, their initial thought is often, well, you just want a big brother. It's not. In fact, we've seen when people implement capturing actuals, time, budget, spend, all of those things, that, that it's a paradigm shift for the worker within an organization. There is no better way to prove that you're overworked when you're capturing time against an allocation that was far less than you needed. It starts to give project managers and executives true visibility into what they need to complete a body of work on time and on budget. And so it's not a big brother exercise. It's an exercise of proving true company capacity. The true spend, the true time, that's spent on a project or an effort is the lesson that we learn to prove how much we can take on as an organization. So if you don't, if you don't budget and you don't capture time, actuals and expense against that budget, you're never going to continuously improve. And that's really what this exercise is, is the continuous improvement exercise. And the concept you're bringing up about <clears throat> the big brother notion, I've seen that where um, one client in particular, their staff just feels very strongly that you don't need to keep track of me, you don't need to track my time, uh, and they go about uh, tracking budget versus actuals in a different way. But but there is a it's not something like that to be passed through and to start out would have to be sold top down so that people get the the right message on that. So if I can see the point. I agree with you. Executives need to make sure people are aware that we're not here to make sure you're working 40 hours a week. We're here to make sure you're not working 60. 
it's yeah. it's a it's a it's a paradigm shift in thinking from punching a time clock to ensuring that our people have balance in their life. If I don't think it's any secret, especially with the generations that are coming, if we can't offer balance to our workforce, we're not going to have long-term success. Okay, I'll move into a little more depth on this now. Um, Brandy, from your perspective, share your thoughts on uh, making budget relative to what actually occurs. Yeah, so I'll give one little example. If a market shifts, so markets can shift by the way you have to deliver service. And we are seeing that with the hourly versus the fixed fee contracts, for example. You realize that you may need to adjust your resources, the types of people you're putting on, on different accounts. You may need to provide training or introduce technologies. And this shift actually can be found when you look at your budget and then you compare what is actually happening with the spend. And when you really look at that and have KPIs in place to track revenue or GP per client, per employee. This allows you to successfully access other capital and or resources that you need if you adjust your, your budget. And we like to call it a forecast because a budget is what you set at the beginning of the year and your forecast is when you adjust it. And it should be adjusted in real time every month to the changing needs of your business. And Tim, what are your thoughts on aligning projects and strategic goals? Well, I, I had an experience to where, and I, I talked about this a little earlier, to where we had strategic goals and the projects aligned to strategic goals and executives have the propensity to to get really excited about the new thing and they get everybody up in excitement. And I remember in, in one particular instance where I was the head of a PMO for a global company where um, I had to take a phone call from the CEO. And the CEO called me and said, what are you talking about? We can't go do this new thing. Are you saying that, that we brought your systems to its knees? And I said, no, but if you go after this, you'll bring the company to its knees. And if we have already decided to focus on the programs that we have, would you like to pivot? Here is the forecasted revenue based on the strategy we've identified. Here's what you will get for that new, new opportunity. And he relented and said, well, let's go get what we had already talked about getting. I hope it works. Well, thankfully for me and for the company at work, to the tune of a $35 million increase, for that year to the bottom line of the organization. It's so important. I, I don't think we can understate enough that it's important that we have predictable goals aligned to strategic goals and that we make sure that we forecast, reforecast, and clarify the impact of the business when those new things come in to try and derail us from what we're doing. Sometimes they will, but you have to make a decision. What do you give up in the, if, if, we, if we move? And another point that we have is projects do fail. And I think our obligation is, is making sure that we identify them to fail early so that we can fail forward and get on with the work of success. All right, from here, we're gonna go into capacity planning. Okay, Brandy, give us your foundational thoughts on capacity planning. Yeah, so capacity planning is really resource planning at its at its height. So whether it be cash, staff, time, technology, determine what the business planning strategy needs to be, whether it be lead planning, lag planning, incremental or adjustment. That's how you decide when you're gonna grow your capacity. Are you gonna do that ahead? of the curve to make sure that you can meet what your plan is. Are you going to do it after you get the workload to be able to meet the work? You have to make that. It is has to be usable at the, at the core because if it's not usable and people don't understand how you're going to plan your capacity, your organization won't follow it. And it needs to happen across 
all lines of management and anyone that is working on hiring, firing, selling, managing, or reporting. The topic I'd like to cover on this is that uh, most accounting systems don't really have much in the way of capacity planning. Even, you know, we talk about the concept, they certainly have accounting systems and you have enterprise resource planning, but quite often that's something that is just absent from applications. So to truly embrace the concept of proactive planning across the enterprise, you really need to have manager resources and come up with some uh, either applications or some means of doing that. So Tim, I'll go to you now and uh, see if you can explain the differences between resource management and capacity planning. Yeah, I think it, I, I'm really glad that you asked that. This is a trick question that I often ask interviewees or when I have an opportunity to be out with my team and we're starting an implementation to where people of our software where people need help in bettering their processes, they're laid on projects, they're, they don't have a lot of visibility. And I ask this question, well, what's capacity planning to you? The number one answer is, well, it's the availability of my resources. <laughs> and that's just wrong. It's like Brandy said, because yeah. that's an element of, of it. But capacity planning is an organization ability to deliver a body of work within a prescribed period of time and what are their their constraints and resources to be able to deliver that and erp we've now we've now you know, we we know that that's an enterprise a planning software but it only relates to the finance side finances are a part of capacity planning do i have enough money to do this it's also do i have enough human resources to do this and third is do i have enough human resources available within the time constraints required to deliver this body of work so capacity planning is the holistic ability of any organization to deliver a body of work so resource planning is only one element capacity planning is the next level of taking an erp and a resource planning tool and looking at those things together and saying, but can we deliver it? Okay, so we'll go a little bit deeper into this. So Tim, I'm flying out some bullet points here. If you can give us your overview on how you manage capacity planning. Yeah, so you can tell on the screen as to how we do it. So we take our resources, our human resources, and we ensure not only do we have enough people, but do those people have the capability and skills to do the work necessary to deliver a successful outcome. And we look at that on a resource management scale to say, okay, here's our people, but here's the skills they have. It's not just the job uh, uh, duties inside of a job, but do they have, for example, the right certifications required of this project to be able to successfully deliver? Do we have realistic expectations of our people? It's unrealistic to think just because you have people that work for you, that they're available to work on this thing full time without any interruption. People get sick, people have uh, paid time off and leave and vacation. And they also, people leave, we have attrition. Have you planned for attrition? And then coupling all of that with other realistic factors, including do we have enough money to do this? Are we gonna need outside resources? Are the risks too great that we it may may cause delay in being able to 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 fully deliver this project. All of those things um, come into play. So it's a, again, it's a continuous improvement effort, and you have to take the lessons learned that you've had in those areas to ensure that you can truly capacity plan. A company has really hit stride when they can truly capacity plan, and it's fun to see when that happens. And I, I've been in a fortunate position to see that happen uh, to many, many really awesome organizations from big to small over my, the past 10 years of my career. Okay, Brandy, uh, from your perspective, uh, the value proposition of each staff member is critical to project success and profitability. So the value proposition of each staff member. Share your thoughts on the impact of properly assigning resources to drive project success and profitability or optimizing costs? 
Yeah, so it's really most projects you don't have just one resource on. So if you're, I'll go back to an IT example. If you do managed services for an IT company and you bring in a managed service contract for $10,000 per month, what resources are required in order to, to provide that customer with the maximum amount of satisfaction that they need in order to be successful? It's not all your level three, tier three engineers. Sometimes it's tier one, tier two, and looking at your staff and properly assessing them, knowing what you pay them, you already know what your revenue is, and assigning their workload appropriately to service that client is crucial. If you put always a, a tier three tech or an engineer to do tier one work, one, you're gonna lose profits, your customer is probably not going to be really happy because of the a tier three tech does not want to do tier one work. That's not why they're in a tier in that role. So by assigning customers appropriately, staff members appropriately to the workload that needs to be done, you will have a happy customer, you'll have happy staff, and ultimately you will have more profitability as well. It's tough though, because you really do have to know what you are delivering, how you need to deliver it, and really assessing your staff, not only on what they say they can do, but realistically what they can do. And that's one of the toughest challenges here because not everybody wants to have that conversation. Okay, now we're going to go into some statistics around what uh, professional service organizations and project management organizations uh, feel they need for automation tools. So on the left, we've got professional services and consulting, and on the right, we've got an example of enterprise IT, and this is how these firms, there was a survey done, uh, Tim, Tim, you can come on, on the, come on the RMI group, but um, survey was done based on uh, the applications that they're using and where they see the most value. So, uh, Tim, from your perspective, you can comment on the statistics we're looking at here. Yeah, we, we have the opportunity to work with the Resource Management Institute, and um, their data is always very strong and trustworthy. And it was a, when we first got this, it was a little bit surprising to see that the, the top, one of the top five or the top of the five reasons for, for PSOs and PMOs needing automation tools was resource management. For, for a long time, I think the PPM world thought the world needed project management. They do, it comes into play. You have to break down your work to know what you're assigning. But resource assignment and management of those resources, both time and the ability to see and report on that and understand where your people are, what they're working on, are, and to, to have that validation that they're progressing on the right body of work um, is really, really eye-opening. And it's something that, that we've continued to focus on in our organization is to ensure that we're, we know the body of work, but knowing the body of work is, is merely half the battle, if that. But ensuring that you've got the right resources, working on the right things at the right time is the thing that's, that's uh, most important, and it's it's fun to see that the that's the top reason that other PSOs, the professional services organizations, and uh, project management offices are actually looking for tools. I'm going to move on to our next slide here. Um, capacity pl capacity planning is about making prudent decisions on what to take on. As organizations grow, the risk of getting it wrong increases. So, Tim, if you could share your thoughts on capacity planning as it relates to the uh, uh, diagram on the right with resource management and so forth. Yeah, so um, remember the story I told you about the CEO to where I essentially told him no. Um, the, uh, my, my being able to tell him no came from having a true capacity plan and looking at our resources, our impact and duration, our timing, our sequence, and our total ROI across our organization gave me the confidence to stand up to the top dog 
as a lowly director of a PMO and say, no, we shouldn't go and do that. And it was scary. Let me tell you, it wasn't just a phone call that I got. The CFO walked into my office on his mobile and said, Tim, I've got Tom on the phone. We'd like to talk with you about this. He closed my door, set the phone down on speaker on my desk. And it was, then it was immediately, it wasn't, hey, Tim, how you doing? It was, are you telling me we brought it to its knees? <laughs> a very scary thing indeed, but I had capacity plans in front of me that I could confidently say, it's not brought us to our knees, but it will. And here's why it's your decision. And he was able to make the right decision based on strategic planning and having a capacity plan in place that made the business a significant amount of additional revenue. So understanding and communicating with a true capacity plan should give an individual much more confidence to be able to suggest what we should do and confidence to say no when the time is right. And Brandy, from your perspective, when working with a new client who's not planning capacity, <clears throat> what's your conversation to get them to focus on that and then on the need to work for proper uh, capacity planning? Yeah, I usually like to start out asking questions to try and assess people where they are. So asking how is, ask about customer satisfaction. Are your customers happy? Are they referring you out? Are they asking you to take on additional jobs or projects for them? That's one indication. If the answer is no, we start the conversation there. Another thing to ask is about your staff. How does your staff feel about their workload? Are they too busy? Are they too bored? Typically, if you are constantly hearing from your staff, I have way too much work, I can't even think, but you know there's not a plan in place, that's when they absolutely need one. Your utilization is usually not doing well, your budget to actuals probably aren't doing well, your project plan, none of that's doing well. And getting the feel from your customers and staff is the very first step to be able to, to set the stage, to be able to build for the capacity. If they do not do that and comparing what they're doing, it leaves issues of, for example, not being able to have capital. If you're not planning your resources well, you may not have enough money to be able to do the things that you wanna do. And that's just one outcome. So knowing what the goals are of the organization, looking at their plan, asking about customers, and asking about employees, and then putting together some KPIs that help shed light on that is really important. All right, moving to utilization. Um, so this is obviously important because this is where you start to make the distinction between just getting work done and getting the right people and the right work. Uh, so to Tim, what's the biggest people must, uh, make in measuring utilization? <laughs> they don't account for the true capability of a person. And what Brandy's mentioned it, we've talked about it on previous slides. Utilization, a 40 hour work week doesn't mean you have 40 hours availability. And if you, if you apply that to your individuals without a relative, relatively reasonable expectation to what a person can actually accomplish in their day of work, you're going to fail. And the, the way to, to, to start to look at that is to ensure that you're making the right assignments, you're tracking those assignments, and that they're assigned to the right things. So I think it, it's becoming a foregone without saying utilization doesn't equal hours in a work week. Yeah. Right, let's go into a little more detail on this. Um, uh, Brandy, continue on with this. Uh, what are your thoughts as far as uh, appropriate resource assignment? Yeah, to ma maximum efficiency isn't just saying work on this account for 30 hours. Maximum efficiency really means doing the tasks that are important to do to meet the goals or desires of the contract that you're managing or the customer need, 
One of the biggest wastes that we see with resources is email, right? We all get sucked into the email monster. Well, email doesn't really provide a good return on investment. When we're, you're a service business, your goal is all about delivering the right amount of services within the margins that you've dedicated with the quality that your customer is expecting. And it's really important to make sure that if you do have email that needs to be monitored, because that happens in outsourced accounting or outsourced IT, you put your lowest level on that. Okay, I'm just gonna move along here to keep us uh, on time. Utilization, uh, Tim, what are your thoughts on differentiating between billable and non-billable utilization? It's tremendously important, especially as we're heading down the path of fixed fee contracts. My, to my team, I'm, I'm asking them to sell more fixed fee and we can be less concerned about utilization and they can deliver things based on the outcomes. And so mm -hmm. proving what is billable versus non-billable helps us identify what those packages and offerings should be. I, I envision a world for delivery persons of not having to worry about utilization and only being only a world of worrying about outcomes and creating such a, a life of balance for people who deliver work that everybody wants to do consultancy work. Where 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was the opposite. You put your time into consultancy, you wore yourself out and you hope for a better day. And I envision that going another way if we do it right and being able to do that right um, means you have to track billable versus non-billable so that you know what you should and shouldn't be charging for as an outcome. Okay. So moving into project management, how well do we track the status of projects? Um, Brandy, what would you say as far as uh, you know, your overall thoughts as far as project management and working with clients to get them to focus on actually uh, making that more of a, not only a, something that's part of their service organization, but maybe even as they have new initiatives internally to uh, drive the success of internal and external projects. Yeah, the big key is measuring outcomes versus outputs, right? And we just talked about this in the last slide. To Tim's point, it's more important to deliver great quality, high quality, consistent service over ensuring that you just check off the boxes. And sometimes we do get in that check off the boxes and not look at the key initiative that is being solved by doing the project. So you have to look at your budget, your time, your quality, your effectiveness, and value add is key. And being able to measure and communicate that is what's gonna set things apart. So to play off that, we'll go right into looking at the, the business impact on this. Um, interesting to think about what are the costs of doing a, a poor project management of a failed project to, to actually go through something and it and does not come to fru fruition. Uh, what are the you know costs of a successful, for the opportunities that come from a successful project and companies need to own this problem of you know ensuring that they are going to achieve the outcome and the impact that they're looking for. Uh, Tim, share your thoughts on project management and the need for consistent discipline in managing projects. For me, quite honestly, is I, I don't see how you can appropriately capacity plan, understand your business's capability to deliver work unless you're managing it as a project. And I know that that's a little bit extreme, um, as a PMP by trade, as somebody that's always worked by projects, maybe I'm a, I'm a little bit on one side of the pendulum, but I, I truly don't understand how you can plan an effort if you don't know what that effort is. So I'm a huge believer that capacity planning and project management and forecast planning and, and success management uh, can't live together. They have to be together to have a, a total solution and output and success in business. And then, Brandy, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to go right into the next slide. But from your CFO practices perspective, 
give us some of your thoughts on clients who successfully manage practices or projects and those who do not. Yeah, if you don't effectively manage projects, one of the biggest things that you'll have is you won't have repeat customers, you won't have referral sources, and ultimately your staff won't be satisfied either. So it, the cost is huge. And if you're a service business, the only thing you can sell is your knowledge and your people. And to, and to deliver a project on time that exceeds expectations is key. And the best way to do that is track the right data and review it often and communicate, communicate, communicate. And Tim, from your perspective, what are your thoughts on why some companies' projects fail or succeed? Well, I think that they, they fail to plan. They fail to be mutually aligned on a singular uh, plan. They don't have a single source of truth. They, they can't see all of their bodies of work in, in one common environment, and they're working desperately. And you know, just to, to go on top of what, what Brandy says, I honestly, I believe in, in my heart of heart that we are in an experience era in business. And I think that the best possible experience that we can provide people is a planned experience. And if we plan that experience and communicate consistently and re-baseline when things happen within that experience and communicate that re-baseline to the client, we're going to give an awesome experience. All right. So now the question is, from what you've learned here, where can you go with this? Our intent with the session has been to be thought-provoking on areas that we know will drive predictability and success. Uh, we will forward a PDF of the topics uh, to serve as a baseline for your personal planning. So we'll send you this presentation if it could help you to go back and look through it. Um, fundamentally, your focus should be to look at managing your capacity, developing predictable forecasting, focus on efficient project management to make projects more predictable. So we'll let uh, Brandy and Tim wrap up some thoughts here. So Tim, share your thoughts on where folks should get started. Well, I think that it's important to look for tools and solutions. And again, a tool is not a solve all. It, I think it has to be a solution of process orientation, change management, and tool implementation that allow people to see their work from an executive level. So top down planning, and we've talked about that, the ability to forecast and ensure the company can take on the work where it meets the work from the bottom up. So the people that are actually doing the work, do they meet in the middle? And if not, are we continuously improving by utilizing our processes and tools to ensure that we can take on work and be on time and on budget with the work that we take on and give the excellent experience that our clients, every client, every business now expects. And I think that, that there are tools out there. I encourage folks to look at Keyed In as one of those tools that do an excellent job of planning from the top and taking the inputs from the bottom and proving out where they meet in the middle and continuously trying to thin that line. And Brandy, what are your recommendations to begin addressing the topics that we've covered today? Yeah, there's two ways to approach it. The first would be to know where you want to go and build a plan around that. Looking at what, if your goal is to sell your company in five years, Map out what you need to do in order to do that and then create the plan, create the metrics in which you need to, to measure that. And you will need technology tools in order to do that. Or if you have no idea where you want to go, look at the trends on where you have been and try and map out a solid growth plan to meet your objectives. And it can start with just looking at your last year of data and seeing how much, how well do you have your data and what questions are open for you. The more you look at your data or you share that data with other people, more questions will become apparent and those are the things that you need to focus on. All right, just to wrap there up. There is I'm no gonna... easy button. No. <laughs> it takes work. Brandy, I'll give you a moment, you can, uh tell everybody a little bit about uh, Next Level CFO. 
Yeah, so we're a service business that offers three main services, which is outsourced accounting, part-time or fractional CFO and COO services, or project-based engagements, where we will do assessments for technology, finance streamline, M&A work, um, valuations, projections, and at any time, if anyone should have any questions at all, we do not ask you to hesitate just to reach out. We'll always answer the phone and answer whatever questions that you may have. All right, Tim, share some thoughts on Keyed In. Yeah, Keyed In, um, you can kind of see, we like to call ourselves the, the tool in the middle, the single source of truth. And you'll, you'll note that we integrate well to other systems and we feel that that's necessary to create a complete solution to allow uh, businesses to understand uh, their capacity and to be able to build and grow based on that understanding. So we're a project and portfolio management tool that has some, some very integrated and specific use cases that the, um, specifically for services organizations and delivery organizations. And we, we aim to provide the total solution with our partners like we've um, been speaking with today and our solution and our internal services people to make sure that we're providing an excellent experience to where businesses can understand their business better, understand um, their opportunities better and, and help that business mature and grow. And this is Mark from Landfall Solutions. I'll play off of this slide a little bit. We live on the ERP side of the world. We work with accounting systems and uh, ERP solutions, and we specifically have teamed up with Keyed In and Next Level on our engagements um, to uh, work with in different capacities. The accounting systems that we work with um, just traditionally do not have, you know, here I've got some listed up here, but they just traditionally do not have the resource planning um, like we've found with Keyed In. And then a lot of the strategic work that we uh, will get involved with in bringing Brandy and her team in, you know, we, we get heavily involved in the procedural implementations. Uh, I personally take a very specific focus on the whole discipline around accounting and ERP to get people to see that it's not just the software, but it's what you bring to your organization. Uh, we do a lot of work with professional ser service organizations, different uh, financial markets, and uh, you know, teaming up with Keaton and Next Level has been a really successful uh, initiative for us. Um, so questions and answers, um, take a look and see if we have any in the, in questions in the chat. If you uh, have any questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and type those in. Um, we also have contact information for myself, Tim, and Brandy up here, and uh, please feel free to reach out to us. As Brandy said, uh, we too always uh, like to answer the phone live, so if anybody ever wants to uh, have a conversation to talk through more similar concepts, we're welcome to do that. Um, and then also, uh, when you receive this slide deck, you will see down uh, there's an appendix at the end of this slide deck that actually shows some samples of some keyed in screens that uh, are an idea of the type of uh, resource management uh, that, and capacity management is available there. So I won't go through all those now, but I want to at least put those up. So I think with that, see if there's any questions. Looks like there's nothing out there now. So if you do have anything, feel free to type that in. Otherwise, we will wrap up at this time. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. We really appreciate your time and uh, wish you the best and luck for successful projects in the future. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.